of the credit unions of BC. And so if you are uh, one of the representatives of the 40 credit unions of BC or Centre One, could you please stand and we'll thank you. Where are you? Punch him back. Yeah. Thank you guys. It took an incredible amount of courage for them to support this film and uh, really appreciate it. And then of course, all of the members of the cast and crew, if you're a cast and crew, could you please stand? Soul Food, come on guys. Bye. Thanks. I'm going to be out in some way. Incredible. Thank you guys. <laughs> Listen, there you go. Come on. Uh, your courage in being part of this film, your willingness to open your lives to us to, to tell the story, and for the crew, to, your hard work and dedication to the ideas in this film, it's really been amazing. And, um, and it is just a really large and diverse move, uh, movement that's going on. I mean, this film is just the tip of the iceberg. Our intention has been to create something that's accessible and entertaining for people who aren't necessarily aware of what's going on. You know, for people who maybe have heard the term co-op because it's in the, you know, Mountain Equipment Co-op, that's all they were. <laughs> and that's, there's a lot of people like that out there who, who could maybe learn from this film. So our, our hope is that this really kickstarts the conversation about the democratic economy and that if you were at all moved by the film or the ideas in the film, that you'll take this film and you'll, you'll share it and uh, you'll get your friends to watch it and maybe host a screening. Um, I do have one announcement. We uh, sold out tonight and so we have uh, opened another screening November 15th uh, if you want to bring your friends. And now we have our lovely panel. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I'll start at the far end. This is Derek Goff from Maker Labs. Maker Labs is a place where you can make just about anything. Um, we have Tracy Klisch. Did I say it right? Yes. Um, manager and CEO of CCEC Credit Union uh, here in East Bend. Um, you all know, of course, Michael Abelman uh, from the Soul Food Street Farms. And Paola Kualitsa from Groundswell, uh, which is a community that supports alternative economic democratic models. So we're going to do a brief q and I've got one question for everybody on the panel, and then we're going to open it up to you guys for any questions that you have for anybody on the panel or for me about the making of the film. So, let's wander over here and sit down. Hi guys. Um, thank you, thanks. So my first question is to sort of like open it up. You know, the film is, is one small perspective on just kind of tip of the iceberg of what's happening, but each of you have your own worlds that you're living in, in this sort of new economy space. So my question for each of you, and maybe we'll, we'll go down the line and we'll grab the mic, is um, what's, what's got you excited in your corner of the new economy right now, like this year, what's happening? Michael, can you grab that? Mm -hmm. Is that just you want me to start? Uh, sure, <laughs> Michael, why don't you start, and then we'll go to Paula. Yeah, give you a chance there. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Well, I think it's, um, I was thinking about this while I was watching the film, that um, those of us who have been involved with uh, natural systems agriculture uh, understand a basic principle that is mirrored in this wonderful film. And that is very simply that we have to return as much as we take out, if, if not more, in fact. Um, and I think uh, hopefully all of us at Soul Food, and I'm glad you calling these folks, I should, we should have them stand again, actually, yeah. but um, understand that, you know, we watch throughout the cycle of the farm season, we see things, we plant seeds, uh, those seeds emerge, um, they come to fruition, those plants die, there's this constant recycling that in, when we are thinking about a healthy economy, uh, there is so much that is mirrored in the systems that we use when we're practicing healthy agriculture. And so, um, really, um, for me, this was a, a wonderful a kind of reinforcement of the work that we're already doing. So, yeah. yeah thanks. Um, Paula, what about you? What's happening in Groundswell? Here, let's uh, send it this way, yeah. We can pull, we can maybe pull them off and you can just pass it back and forth, yeah. So for, for those who don't know Groundswell, maybe you can give the one sentence introduction to what it is, sure. if, if that's possible. Thanks, Trevor. Well, thanks for having me up here. Um, so Groundswell is a community-based alternative business school, um, business very uh, wide definition. So we work with really early stage um, people of all sorts, ordinary folks, unlikely entre entrepreneurs, uh, to, who want to start social enterprises, that's nonprofits, cooperatives, 
small businesses uh, in a nutshell, so with alternative education. Awesome. So what's new? What's happening in your kind of corner of the world? What's happening is that there's a lot of traction in this idea of social enterprise, and this isn't this year. This has been going on for a while. Um, social enterprise really has been happening for probably for decades. <laughs> um, but what I'm seeing is a is that people who are sort of unlikely entrepreneurs, like folks who wouldn't um, explore the world of, of small business ownership in this economic um, system that we're living in now, that that feels really unattainable uh, to most people. They're feeling, they're following that feeling in their gut, and they're really, um, like something isn't right here. And I feel like Groundswell is one of the organizations that are able to, that's able to offer opportunities to those people that you, know, you can actually you know, do what you love and take ownership of, of your own economy in a way. So that, uh, yeah, just a lot of young people, young ideas, um, not only young people, but sort of retirees who are suddenly like, I want to give back. Right. And uh, they're coming back and they want to like, create uh, these new model, new economic models for themselves that actually give back. Great, great, thanks. Maybe Tracy, we'll go to you. Um, so what's, what's happening in your corner of the new economy world? Can I tell everybody what CCEC is yes, first? Yes, please. Um, you may not know, but CCEC is, uh, it's a really small little credit union. It's about a two minute walk from here. It's on 7th and Commercial. And it started about um, 40 years ago in 1976 by a group of community activists um, and organizers to um, come together and fuel all their money to support local economic change. Um, so it's been around for 40 years. I think it has this amazing mission and vision and history. Um, and I think what's interesting to me, I'm relatively new to CCEC and I came from a very large credit union. Um, so it's, you know, pretty different world, but is the interest that people have in kind of this different economic model or choosing something super local, wanting to see where their money goes, wanting to know that it's invested in the community, um, people that are disenchanted with big banks and are kind of following the money and want that community feel. So I think there could be a wonderful um, opportunity for a lot of small credit unions uh, to find really meaningful relationships with people who care where their money goes. And one of the interesting things we found in doing the research uh, unintentionally was that a lot of the local examples that we found, even all over the province, actually bank with CCEC, that you guys have been supportive of what's happening out there. Uh, Derek, over at, over at the end, uh, can you tell us just briefly what Maker Labs is and tell us a bit of what, about what's happening in your space? Uh, sure. So Maker Labs is a maker space. And the whole mission of Makerspace is to provide access to tools. And that could be tools as simple as a hammer to very high-tech tools like 3D printers and laser cutters. Um, so our, I guess in the last year, we found a new home in Strathcona. So we are in a big warehouse um, in Strathcona near East Hastings and Hawks. And we moved into this um, very large warehouse without knowing uh, how it would go because we went from a very small shop to a medium warehouse to now a very large warehouse. And in the past year, um, I'm very happy to say that we've been able to support that business model. And we've been able to fill out the entire space with hundreds of members, hundreds of businesses, and um, it's a place where people can come and use tools even if they've never had experience with them. We teach people how to use the tools and we provide a space where you can access the tools and make whatever you can think of. Thanks. There's a real theme you can see of people loving to get their hands on things. And if you like making things, you definitely need to go check out Maker Labs. OK, we're going to open up to the audience. What I'm going to do is, if you have a question, just shout it out to me, and I'll repeat it so everybody can hear it. Yeah, so I was curious about what or who is really working against the new economy in your various spheres. For example, finding land and space was presented a few times during this film. Maybe there's other other things that should be brought up, uh, or maybe there's even, are they counselors, or what's stopping the progression? Yeah, that's great. So for everyone else, the question was, what's standing in your way, or who's standing in your way in terms of uh, moving things forward? It could be about space, or it could be about some of the other issues. So maybe 
Um, Michael, do you want to answer? And Tracy, do you want to answer? We'll sort of alternate it a bit so we can. Well, I, I can try. I can tell you that, uh, I'll just give you an example. Uh, of course, in our situation, land is, um, is a challenge. When we started this project, there were many uh, abandoned or available lots available to us. And now, as the uh, real estate economy in Vancouver has grown and exploded to the degree that it has, it's very hard for us to find places uh, and certainly places that have some, some form of tenure. Uh, most of our leases are minimum three-year leases. Uh, last spring, I believe it was, we received an eviction notice from that beautiful orchard that you saw footage of in the, uh, in the film. And it turned out the eviction notice was to replace the orchard with low-income housing. And when I met with the city, the conversation was, well, who gets to decide which is more important for this population that we work with? Meaningful employment or housing? They're both important. So in the end, we came up with a, uh, a collaboration. Uh, and we will, of course, have to give up part of that location and kind of crowd our trees in a bit more in order to accommodate the um, modular housing that will go in there. But it's a great opportunity to actually uh, uh, create something out of what was initially a uh, kind of a crisis. You know? um, and you know, I think that um, uh, you know, in terms of the city, and I'm sure there are city representatives here tonight, um, that uh, you know, what happens is that the flavor of the month or the year uh, takes precedence over um, what was, and there was a point where urban agriculture was very important. Right now, housing is very important, and, and rightfully so. Um, this is considered to be one of the most expensive um, cities in the world, perhaps, um, and yet not everyone shares in that prosperity. And so finding strategies that address both employment and housing are, I think, really important. I don't know if that answered the question. I don't even remember what the question was. Chris, <laughs> <laughs> why don't we hear from you? So different perspective, just different worlds, although I totally agree with everything um, that Michael was saying. I think, when I think of CCEC um, and uh, small um, independent credit unions, I think a lot of it is, um, it, it's either maybe apathy or people just don't know the difference. Like I, I think of one of the easiest, the most simplest forms of activism is switch your money to a credit union. You know, bank locally, follow where your money goes. And maybe that's too inconvenient um, for a lot of people uh, when it comes to building the credit union movement. Um, people are used to no compromises and getting everything um, really instantly. And uh, I don't know, or they just get used to a relationship um, with whatever financial institution they bank with. I think for the other thing for CCEC, because we're very particular in our values and our vision, and that's where we want to support, I'll never compete with big banks and big credit unions on price and cheap mortgages. and. Um, you know, fancy packages in, um, in your account because that's not what we're about. But for me, is seeking out and finding the opportunities in those new relationships that we can partner with people and invest in. And it's a little tougher when you're, um, you know, when you're really small and you're a small group of staff um, that's trying to, to run everything. So, um, yeah, I think to be able to find more um, like-minded people uh, that, uh, that you can work with would be wonderful. Thanks. Maybe uh, another question from the audience, and if you could direct it to one, somebody on the panel. Anybody else up there? Yes, I see a waving hand. <laughs> see me? Okay. Uh, so I love everything in the film. I think we see a lot more of that uh, if we had a basic guaranteed income so that people could, you know, could choose what their interest is. I know in 1970, my friend's dad was head of planning for the Air Force uh, government, health and welfare, and he told me the only reason they hadn't put it in, they didn't work out for 20 years, was public opinion, so conditioned. And then I saw a quote, I had actually made a film about it, you know, how, you know, wow, how we move forward. And then I saw a quote from, uh, I think it was Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, or, and said, look, if you don't have X number of people unemployed, you know, 
money you're not going to have X number of people willing to come up to work for a wage which is a little poverty. Okay, then you've had all this reganomics. Well, look what these welfare levels have done to the country. And it's only public opinion. I think that's why people are, are so depressed in our society, because we know this. We know these people are poor because we're deliberately depriving a section of our population. And it's costing us three times as much as you know the medical bills. Why don't, why don't I take your comment and, uh, and kind of turn it into a question? Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, great. Yeah, minimum basic in income is the comment that this could be a potential solution. And maybe I'll ask how... Yeah. Yes. So let me let me interrupt you just so we get the. It, it's minimum basic in, income is a really important idea that I think is is worthy of research and taking a look into. But it's also controversial as as you mentioned. So, pa Paula, maybe I can ask uh, Paula some ideas on what are you seeing that's actually working on the ground right now. So. Barring a, a, a national global policy on some of these things, national policy on some of these things, what are you seeing that's working at a local level? Uh, in my world of uh, small startups and entrepreneurship at Groundswell, we, especially because we attract a lot of people who are low income uh, in our program, is, um, I mean, it takes money to start a business. You can to start a nonprofit with its grants or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, there's the obvious, like, you might have to work a part-time job for a while or, you know, sacrifice uh, your values over there for a little bit um, to keep yourself going for a while uh, before your own thing gets going. But um, what we find happening kind of spontaneously in the community that Groundswell's creating amongst our alumni and also other small businesses uh, in the city and small startups is the barter economy, so other types of exchange that kind of makes up for, I mean, it, some of that cash flow that makes it really hard to live whether you're running a business or just um, you know doing your own uh, or you have a job and it's your own expenses so we see that collaborative economy or cooperative um, uh, models working in sort of organically with these, the small businesses so it's like you're you have the graphic design firm right. um, you'll yeah. create Maybe, my logo and I'll do something for you. Derek this might actually uh, kind of work over to you because there isn't necessarily a specific structure over at Maker Labs but I would guess that you see a lot of that collaboration happening in your space. Uh, we do. We actually have a lot of members who are brand small alumni and <laughs> students. So the way that Maker Labs is kind of laid out is it's very large rooms and all we have are tools and square footage that people can use. So there's no artificial walls. If people want to build walls, they can, but otherwise it's an open environment where there's a lot of kind of organic mingling and collaboration. So we don't have any formal structures um, or programs that force people to mingle, but because by the very nature of the space, people are all in the same space and they all see what everybody else is doing, um, they naturally um, and very organically collaborate. Thanks. I'm told that we have time for one more question, so who has a burning question out there? Wave your arms wildly. Yes, right down here. Is the downtown east side or Vancouver in general, the Silicon Valley for social innovation, social enterprise? Yeah, so, so the question is, is the downtown east side the equivalent of Silicon Valley for social innovation? So I can actually, I feel like a little bit qualified to actually answer this question for once. Um, so we did a massive amount of research on this film. Um, we went through more than 600 case studies. and. You definitely see that the centers of innovation on these things kind of focus in two areas. One is places like the downtown east side. So yes, definitely, there is a lot happening here because of these people and others who are doing this work and coming up with new models. And you see it in other depressed areas in large urban centers. The other place that you see it is kind of on the edges of academia where you have people doing research or starting new projects where they have um, the freedom and the openness to be able to try a new project. And, you know, one of our uh, kind of goals and ideals with the film was to try to have a diversity balance and gender balance both in the crew and in, in our subjects in the film. And one of the interesting challenges was that a lot of the people that have the freedom to experiment with these things are white men because they have the privilege already in their world in order to be able to have the extra little margin on their lives to experiment with these ideas. That's one area where it is happening. And the other area is where people in areas of crisis are saying, okay, 
we could solve this together. So I do think that there's something special that's happening here. I, think, I don't think it's just an accident that all of these people are here and that the film is a Vancouver-based film, for sure. So uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, we'll be around out in the lobby or out on the sidewalk because they might kick us out if you want to ask questions. Um, I have two announcements just to wrap things up. So first of all, um, I'm proud to say that uh, all of the proceeds from tonight will go to Saltwood Street Farms and we raised $2,740. So thank you all for coming and thank you all for contributing to that. And as a way of getting you all up so that you will get up and uh, hopefully quickly exit so we're out of here by night, uh, there are three books uh, of Michael's new book called Street Farm that we are giving away tonight. And there are post-it notes, stickers underneath your seat so if you all stand and take a look under your seat, like really under, you have to like let the seat flip up. Right Melissa down here has those three books. You can come see her with that post-it note or with a really good story about why you want the post-it note. Cheering down this Because uh, Trevor will never seek uh, gratitude for himself. I want to make a round of applause for the special dedication to the values and principles of cooperation and cooperatives uh, seek this gentleman out. And uh, he's a true partner and a true friend of ours, so thank you, Trevor.